The ability to solve problems is as important as it is difficult, but finding a way to bring harmony to groups of people who hold very different opinions would be a challenge even for King Solomon himself. So what can we do when our church members start to fight? Is it possible for us to heal church division and bring unity to our churches? Well, the short answer is yes. Stay tuned to this week's podcast because today, Kent, Vicki, and Nathan will be showing us from the book of James how we can solve one of the church's most difficult problems. Welcome to Crosstalk, a Christian podcast whose goal is for us to encourage each other to not only increase our knowledge of the Bible, but to take the next step beyond information into transformation. Our goal is to bring the Bible to life into all our lives. I'm Brian French, and today, Dr. Kent Edwards, Vicki Hitzkis, and Nathan Norman continue their discussion through the book of James by looking at James chapter 4, verses 4 to 10. If you have a Bible handy, turn to James chapter 4, verses 4 to 10, as we join their discussion. Uh, Nathan, Vicki, as you know, last week we looked at the problem of church conflict. And I found it interesting this week to come across a couple of studies. One done by Faith Communities Today uh, involved a 14,000 congregation study back in 2015 that found that 75% of congregations have experienced conflict in the past. Mm. Serious church conflict. Mm. And a 2001 Hartford Institute study discovered that 79% had a conflict in the past five years. Wow. I mean, do, do those numbers surprise you? They're stunning to me. They're stunning, but I'm very cynical <laughs> about this kind of thing. <laughs> and uh, no, that kind of jives with my personal observations from my colleagues and, and my own church experience. Yeah, it's sad, especially as we noted last week in a COVID-19 world, when the pressure is really on, there tends to be an increase in church conflict. How do we run church? What do we do? What if finances are, are in tight supply? All those situations come together to create a a breeding ground for conflict. And conflict debilitates organizations. Uh, You know, I enjoy reading uh, business books. And I came across in one article, a recent study that was conducted across a wide variety of businesses that found 65% of work performance problems and as much as 42% of employee time is spent resolving conflict. Wow. That's amazing. Isn't that awful? That's amazing. So think of the bottom line effect on a company's profit, right? I mean, rather than getting out there and making the widgets or whatever they make and selling the widgets or whatever that involves in, um, instead, they're all consumed with internal problems. They're spending time and resources fighting fires, not getting the job done. And, and that's what happens in the church too, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, when we get involved in internal issues, then we're obviously not looking outside at a world that desperately needs to hear about Christ. That job is simply not getting done. And you're exhausted, right? So (laughs) once, once, once it's over, you're too exhausted to do anything anyway. Yeah, but it happens. It happens today, it happened in the first century. That's why James says in James four, verse one, what causes fights and quarrels among you? The only reason he's talking about fights and quarrels is because there were fights and quarrels that were breaking out among the people of God in the first century. And the weapon of choice was mentioned in verse 11. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. They used their tongues to attack, to uh, to fall, to throw false accusations against one another. And people would get mad and fight back and on and on it would go. And But so today I want to look at not the problem, but the solution. I mean, how do we solve the problem? So we know that there has been and is uh, church conflict going on, but how do we resolve this so we can get on the work of Christ? Well, James begins to answer this question in typically blunt talk by outlining what we ought not to do. He says in verse uh, four, you adulterous people, 
Don't you know with friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. This is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Notice in verse 4, do you not know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? I don't know if you guys remember much of your high school history list classes. Anybody? Anybody? You remember? Was that a favorite subject? I passed it. It, <laughs> <laughs> it, it depends which part of history. I don't care. Eddie, what did you take? Ancient history, American history, European history? European, I don't know anything about. I recall a really cute current affairs uh, history teacher. I see. Okay, <laughs> okay well, um, thank you for being so revealing. Um, and one of the things I remember about history, one of the things that fascinated me about it, was that they tended to always talk about the wars. Mm. So the, the history of humanity, they defined as first this war, and then this war, and then this war, and then this. What an interesting point. And so these wars were pivot points. Yeah. So, it, it, I mean, look around today. Look at the conflict. I mean, we're not in a world war at the moment, but there are scads of wars, perhaps more wars today than any other time in history. So the human inclination is when there is a problem, we address it with brute strength, right? We attack. Yes. We get our way. We impose our will. That is the human solution. And James is saying, you adulterous people, you, because he's already talking about the conflict and quarrels, the fighting that's going on between them. When you decide to adopt a warlike strategy in order to advance supposedly God's kingdom in your, in your interchurch fight, that friendship, that's friendship with the world. That's utilizing the world's strategies. And that means that you are against God. That is not God's strategy. So what is he saying here? James begins to answer the problem of how do we deal with church fights by saying quite plainly, stop fighting. This is not the strategy you are to use. When you fight your brothers and sisters in Christ, you are falling into Satan's trap. And as you use his strategy, you will discover two things. First, you'll discover fighting won't help your church. I mean, can we just turn on the news and see what's happening, at least in America? Everyone in Washington today and online, it seems, is insulting each other, hmm. throwing verbal grenades back and forth at each other, accusing people of terrible things. That, And it's totally un unproductive. And we get nowhere by using the world's tactics. It doesn't work in Washington. It doesn't work in the world. It doesn't work in the church. Stop fighting because fighting won't help your church. It will hurt your church. You just won't help it. Secondly, he says we're to stop fighting because fighting won't help you. Look down at verse 11 and following. Brothers and sisters, James says, do not slander one another. Again, that's the weapons of choice used in church and, frankly, politics and in the world and certainly online these days. Do not slander. Because anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. And when you judge the law, you are not keeping it but sitting in judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and judge the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? When you join in a church fight by throwing verbal grenades, you are, as he says in verse 11, speaking against a brother. Those who slander as they speak against a brother see themselves as spiritually superior. Notice when it says in verse 12, there's only one lawgiver and judge, but you, who are you 
to judge your neighbor. When you judge, when you say this person is terrible, this person is wrong, and you throw those grenades, you're taking the place of God. And Jesus tells us explicitly in Matthew 7, not to judge others, but to first take the plank out of your own eye. The judge of the whole world will do right. It's not your job. As you do that, you lead yourself into sin. Those verbal grenades are themselves sin. And so the, you think you're combating sin, but you're entering into more sin. Stop fighting. It's not going to help the church, and it won't help you. Is that true? I mean, is that true to life, guys? Is, is this kind of fighting counterproductive? I've never heard someone say, well, that was a really good church split. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go break up another one. <laughs> no, it hurts. Yeah, it can be long-term hurt. Mm -hmm. um, there are um, uh, church situations that I've heard of where the splits have been so divisive and um, ugly that it has hurt the church's reputation for a generation or more. It takes a long time to live that down. Yeah. So James is just being quite honest. Stop fighting because it, it won't help your church and it won't help you. It hurts both. I mean, it's just clear. That's what the world does and that's what we're not to do. And if we do it, we enter into more sin. But he's not just negative. James is also positive. And he tells us what we should do. What should we do when a church is fighting? I think we should start repenting. Look at what he says in verses 7 through 10. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Satan's heart is a black hole of selfish pride that led him to rebel against God. When we fight and quarrel among brothers and sisters of Christ, we are Satan's foot soldiers. We are actually, maybe unintentionally, advancing Satan's agenda and working against God's work in the world. And that's why he says, submit yourselves then to God. Come near to him, and he will lift you up. And did you notice in verse 6, the good news is that while God opposes the proud, he gives grace to the humble. Pride is an insidious sin and a very dangerous one. C.S. Lewis tells us, as long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. Hmm. When you're looking down at others, you are not looking up at your Lord. Okay. So I'm sure that a number of our listeners see themselves in their church in this passage. We can look back in sorrow at the behavior we have had, our church has had. We want to stop it. We want to be part of the cure, not the problem. We understand that James is saying that we are to repent, to grieve, mourn, and wail, to humble ourselves before the Lord so that he will lift us up. How do we apply that cure of repentance? How do we help this simple message, a simple but difficult message, take root in our, in our churches, in our Christian communities? My example would be sometimes is you have two people arguing about evangelism. We both agree that evangelism should be done. One person believes crusade evangelism is the best way to get things done, right? Because work for Billy Graham changed the world. 
So we need to be doing crusade evangelism. Next person says, are you kidding me? It's four spiritual laws because I was saved by four spiritual laws. And I think we need to go out and give people a simple tool and tell, teach them how they can reach their, the community for Christ. You're the guy that put the drums on the stage. I know. So, <laughs> and then there's the people who didn't, right? So, so they're fighting and they're like, they both think they're right. And they both think the other person is strategically wrong. So even though you're convinced that they are wrong and you are right, to be involved in fights and quarrels is a sin. Go, weep, repent, and go to the person, repent to the Lord. I think I would start there. Um, and I would go to the person that you have acted inappropriately to and repent to them too, as hard as that is. Because that action, not necessarily the conviction, but the action was wrong. Okay, so as hard as it is, um, even when we're convinced we're in the right, we need to repent before the Lord. We need to grieve, mourn, and wail, change our laughter to mourning, and humble ourselves to the Lord for him to lift us up. But when we've done that, I think we need to help others who may need to repent. Nathan, you've been involved in that. It's not just a personal repentance, but sometimes we need to come to the help of others who may have a blind spot or a hesitancy. How do we help others to genuinely repent? Yeah, you know, we see in Matthew 18 how we confront people who are in sin, as fellow believers in sin, and you go to them personally. Uh, and and kind of in my 21st century dialect, I'll just say, hey, I've seen this issue. What's going on? And then have a conversation about it. If they're not willing to admit any wrongdoing, you bring a witness, uh, you bring multiple witnesses, you bring them uh, elders before them, you bring them to the church, and then eventually you throw them out of the church, right? Uh, what we see there is Jesus is uh, telling us you you basically start off soft, and then you increase the pressure as the belligerence against the sin goes on. But what we have to be really careful with, at least what I've found, is sometimes we just have like differences of opinions or personal conflict. Mm. And I want to make sure that what the other person is doing when I'm confronting them is actually sinful. And it's not just that I disagree with them or their personality rubs me the wrong way or I don't mm -hmm. like the way they dress. Uh, it has to be an actual sin. So what I usually do before I confront anyone that I'm having a problem with, I'll go to Galatians, as we talked about last week, Galatians 5.19, and there is a pretty comprehensive, although there's a few other sins that are not listed here, but a list of sins that I will go and I'll say, okay, is this individual doing these things? Idolatry? Well, yeah, their political uh, worship uh, rises to that level, sure. Creating strife? Yes. Outbursts of anger? Okay, that that's one. And I'll actually take this list and I will go and say, hey, uh, here's what I'm seeing. And um, and here's what uh, what Paul says. It's a work of the flesh. Uh, what's going on and, and how can we work this out? Uh, and, and oftentimes, if I can come and I can define from Scripture the sin, a person will often uh, will often admit that what's going on is, is going on. And as long as you confront the sin in love, uh, they mm -hmm. repent. And what I've typically found is I've never had to exercise church discipline to the point where we bring them in front of the whole church and kick them out. If they're so belligerent and they're so filled with pride, uh, by the time you bring a witness or two or maybe sit down with the elders, they've already left the church. And that's an unfortunate difficulty of American life, but they've left the church uh, because they do not want to confront their sin. And it hurts, uh, but ultimately it helps. The other thing I want to mention, too, is I think modeling repentance mm. is is really helpful, e even if it's from the pulpit and there's a text that beat you up and convicted you of something, outbursts of anger, rage, dissension, maybe even idolatry. You know what? I've been too fearful about this election. I've put too much hope in a political candidate and uh, God revealed to me it's idolatry and I need to repent. Uh, that goes a long way to create a culture in the church of repentance, uh, of corporate repentance even. Uh, don't you think, Vicki, I... Isn't there an aspect of corporate repentance when a church has gone off the rails? Nathan, Nathan, you have the nicest way about you. I bet you are the most amazing pastor. Um, you, you just have a you just have a nice way of, of handling things. You mentioned not to fight with you, but <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that ultimately you you bring you, you go to the person and then you bring somebody else and then you bring somebody you bring several people and then you go to the elders and then if they still refuse to listen 
you treat them as you, you kick them out. However, I had a talk with my dad about this, and he said what the text actually says is you treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. And he said, so how would you treat a pagan or a tax collector? How would you treat a non-Christian? I'm glad that you brought that up. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, you, you treat them with love. You try to right. win them over. Right. You evangelize them. You evangelize them. You, you don't think, oh, this is a believer. You look at the fruit and you think, I need to love this person. Yeah. Right. But I think, yeah, I think, Nathan, I think your point was that yeah, you can't recognize them as being part of the church. Yeah, they can't, they can't represent, if their bad behavior continues, they can't represent who the church is about. And, um, but I'm glad Vicki said what she said, because it's not just a callous, I'm ah, forget for you. Too. I meant for that to be recorded because you said that twice. Right. Yeah. No. And I'm glad that you said that because it's not a callous forget you. And I'm glad that you brought that up and clarified that because it is exactly like your father said, it is you, you're treating them like you take them off the, the church membership roster. They're not publicly representing the church anymore, but uh, you are, you still love them. You care for them. You sure. evangelize them and mm -hmm. you treat them as if they are not a believer because they are living and uh, in sin. And you, you tell them, repent and believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, I already do. Well, you're not living it. Uh, James says there's no fruit of that. You need to follow Jesus Christ. You need to repent and believe in the good news. And they're not, and if, if they continue in their belligerence they they won't repent, but hopefully at some point they'll, they'll break down and say, yeah, I will repent. So that, Vicki, thank you for saying that. That is a wonderful clarification. And uh, I'm glad you didn't let me oversimplify that. <laughs> and just to continue for a moment, yeah, it's interesting that uh, the teaching that you are quoting from Matthew 18 come, was written by Matthew, who was a tax, tax collector. collector. Yeah. So yeah. how was he treated? With love, with grace, and an invitation to follow Christ, right? Amen. Yep. Yeah. Amen. So I think we should treat in the same way. I've often thought, boy, isn't it interesting that a tax collector wrote that? It is interesting. So how, what's the cure? James says there's got to be repentance. And I think that there's three ways that we need to apply that. We need to personally repent for things that we have done. Now, there's times obviously you can be innocent in a situation, but still, if your response is incorrect, you need to respond even for, you need to repent even for that. Secondly, there's helping others to repent, as Nathan just mentioned in Matthew 18. But there's also, I think, a place for corporate repentance. I am struck by the prophet Joel when um, we read in chapter one and chapter two, put on sackcloth, you priests, and you mourn. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Summon all the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. And rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent. So here in this passage, while there is certainly individual sin that people needed to deal with, and certainly while it's appropriate in this context to help others in the nation who were sinning, to recognize their sin and help them repent, there's a sense in which everyone as part of the family owns the sin and comes to God and says, forgive us for our trespasses. Mm. I think we wrestle somewhat with this. Why should I have to repent if they did the problem? I can just tell you from working with Crosstalk Global, working with pastors in many different cultures around the world, that that is a, an American question. American culture is the most individualistic in the history of the world. I'm not saying it's evil, it's just saying it is, it's individualistic. We see ourselves in total isolation as an island unto ourselves, independent of what anyone else does and not responsible. That's not how the rest of the world operates, certainly not in the East where the Bible was written, and it's certainly not a biblical concept. The Bible sees us as we become part of the family of God 
to be a family. And what we one person does affects every member of the family. The name of God is affected. And we come as a group and uh, as a community and ask God to forgive us corporately because we're part of the community. Um, we have a responsibility to come and ask for God's forgiveness on all of us. I think that repentance can heal a divided heart and restore it to ministry. As hard as that repentance work does, I think it's uh, it's the way forward. I say that partly because of what happened in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 10, God did a hard work with Peter. He had to convince him that Gentiles could be allowed into the family of God. It wasn't just for Jews, Gentiles could come. And you guys may remember, you know, the, you know, the cloth coming down from the heaven and the different kinds of food. And he says, that's unclean. And God says, you know, I want you to eat it. Don't call unclean what I call clean. And finally, Paul, uh, Peter agrees. He says, God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him. He, he got his theology correct. But five chapters later, we learned that Peter had changed his mind. A group of believers who belonged to the part of the Pharisees that the Gentiles, who taught that Gentiles who converted must be circumcised, they got a hearing and they got heard by Peter. And he stopped eating with the Gentile Christians. He walked back on his theology. The issue was splitting the church. And in Galatians chapter 2, we read that Paul discovered this on the back of one of his missionary journeys. And he had the courage in front of everyone to confront him of his sin, tell him he was doing wrong. That is an amazing thing. I mean, this is Peter, the rock on which the church would be built, the one who was, who was up in the Mount of Transfiguration, one of the three closest disciples. And yet he, Paul was confronted him of what he was doing wrong. And notice what took place in Acts 15. Paul did not slander Peter. He talked to him directly. Paul went to Peter and had the courage to confront him. Peter had the humility to listen and repent. Admitted it publicly, the Council of Jerusalem agreed, and Jews and Gentiles were seen to be equal members of the Church of Jesus Christ. This huge potential split that could have ended the early church was healed because genuine repentance took place. And they refocused on the mission and they took the world for Christ. Isn't that exciting? It is. It's amazing too. Yeah, I, I can say that uh, on occasion when I have in a meeting uh, lost my temper or said things I shouldn't have said, uh, when I go back and I as a leader, as the pastor of the church, if I repent, what do I have to lose? I lose face. I lose my pride. And mm -hmm. that moment of repentance brings our team closer together than ever before. And it gives them the freedom to repent when they need to repent as well. It has brought us uh, just as a fellowship of believers incredibly close. It is an incredibly powerful thing to repent. It unifies the church. Hmm. It models it models the, the grace of God and restores us to service. Church division is awful, but it is a problem that can and must be solved. All we need to do is realizing, is realize that fighting is sin and repent. No, it's not easy, but it's possible and it is healing. It may be interesting for us to end this podcast by hearing the last prayer Jesus prayed before he was arrested and began his journey to the cross. A prayer he prayed for us. Nathan, could you pray that for us? Jesus said, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity 
Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Amen. If you are in a divisive church, repentance needs to start with you. It may not need to end with you, but it needs to start with you. I trust that today's discussion of God's word has been helpful and served as an encouragement to not just be hearers of the word, but doers. Together, let's bring God's word to life, to our lives this week. The Crosstalk Podcast is a production of Crosstalk Global, equipping biblical communicators so every culture hears God's voice. To find out more or to support the work of this ministry, please visit www.crosstalkglobal.org. You can also support this show by sharing it on social media and telling your friends. Be sure to listen next Friday as we continue our discussion of the book of James and discover how we should plan for the future, especially in business. You won't want to miss it.